The Bolsheviks Come to Power by um, Alexander Rabinowich. This is chapter two, The Bolsheviks Under Fire. The attack on the Bolshevik party in the wake of the July days was launched by Zivoslovo, a reactionary, scandal-mongering boulevard newspaper, aptly characterized by Lenin as a yellow, base, dirty little rag. Zivoslovo stood for law, order, and strong rule at home, an unrelenting war to total victory against the central powers. It regarded as arch enemies, socialists generally, and the extremist Bolsheviks in particular. One can easily imagine with what glee Zivoslovo's editors received the Alexinsky Pank Pankratov charges on the evening of July 4th. Interpreting subsequent efforts by Prince Lvov and others to delay their publication as proof that radicals in the highest levels of government were part of the nefarious plot to sell out Russia to the foreign foe. They published the sensational statement in full on the morning of July 5th, prefaced by a front page banner headline, Lenin, Ganetsky, and Kozlovsky, German spies. Yakov Ganetsky and whom German money had allegedly been funneled to the party. The Bolsheviks promptly protested. A short note in Pravda on July 5th, written even before Zivoslovo reached the streets, warned readers that hostile circles might be planning a campaign to slander the Bolshevik leadership. Immediately after the appearance of the Alexinsky Pankratov statement, Lenin dashed off several scathing newspaper essays, vehemently denying the charges against him and attempting to rebut them. Simultaneously, other top Bolshevik leaders implored Soviet officials to protect them from being crucified by the press. In response, the Central Executive Committee issued an appeal, urging the public to refrain from commenting on the accusations against the Bolsheviks until a special committee of inquiry to be set up by the Soviet had had time to conduct a thorough investigation. Once Zivoslovo had opened the floodgates, however, neither the protests of the Bolsheviks nor the entreaties of Soviet leaders could prevent the eruption of an ugly scandal concerning the Bolsheviks' alleged German ties. By midday on July 5th, Petrograd buzzed with rumors that Lenin is a, pro a provocateur. The statement by Alek Aleksinsky and Pank Pankratov was immediately reproduced as a leaflet and within hours, copies were being handed out by the hundreds on street corners. By the next day, many Petrograd newspapers were treating the charges as established fact and openly competing with one another to produce sensational accounts of Bolshevik treachery. Newspaper headlines on July 6th and 7th conveyed the ferocity of this campaign. A second in Great Azev... Fuck. Azev China proclaimed a headline in the rightist Malenkaya Gazeta its editor recalling the scandal that had rocked the Russian revolutionary movement in 1908 when it was revealed that the Socialist Revolutionary Party leader Evno Azev was working for the police. The editor of a popular non-party daily, Petrogradsky Listok, did not dig as far back for his headline. Horrors, he captioned his story in reference to July 4th when both the government and the Soviet were at the mercy of rioting workers and soldiers. Petrograd was seized by the Germans. Accusations against the Bolsheviks made on July 9th by the venerable Georgi Plekhanov, father of the Russian Social Democratic Movement and editor of the newspaper Edinstvo, were no less explicit. 
in response to a government telegram published the previous day, which declared, it has been definitely established that German agents took part in organizing the July disturbances, Plekhanov observed. If the government is convinced of this, the riots cannot be treated as if they were merely the regrettable result of tactical confusion. Apparently, the disruptions were an integral part of a plan formulated by the foreign enemy to destroy Russia. Therefore, stamping them out must be a constituent part of any plan for Russia's national defense. Concluded Plekhanov, the revolution must crush everything in its way immediately, decisively, and mercilessly. One of the most widely circulated post-July days indignments of the Bolsheviks was written by the famous old populist Vladimir Burtsev. Notorious years earlier for his relentless pursuit of police spies and revolutionary organizations, Burtsev was, in 1917, an ultra-nationalist close in political outlook to Plekhanov. On July 6th, in an open letter subsequently printed in many Petrograd papers, he joined the onslaught against the Bolsheviks. As to whether or not Lenin was a German agent, Burtsev commented, Among the Bolsheviks, provocateurs and German agents have played and continue to play a great role. In regard to the Bolshevik leaders about whom we are now asked, we can say, no, they are not provocateurs. But, thanks to them, to Lenin, Zinoviev, Trotsky, etc., during those damnable days, July 3rd, 4th, and 5th, William II achieved what he had previously only dreamed about. In those days, Lenin and his comrades cost us no, no less than a major plague or cholera epidemic. Wreck, the organ of the cadets, was relatively cautious in its treatment of the Alexinsky Pankratov accusations. While affirming the principle that the Bolsheviks ought not to be judged guilty until the charges against them had been proven, writers for Reck in their insistence on strong measures against the left tacitly accepted the validity of the charges. A front page account of the scandal and the right Menshevik den on July 6th was similarly circumspect. It bears recording that unlike Edinstvo and Den, several moderate socialist papers in Petrograd, um, Izvestia Golosoldata and Volia Naroda, for instance, heeded the admonitions of the Central Executive Committee to refrain from commenting, directly or indirectly, on the merits of the treason charges against Lenin and his followers. This provided the party scant relief, however. For with the lone exception of Maxim Gorsky, Gorky's Novaya Zizin, the entire socialist press rejected Bolshevik claims that the July movement had been spontaneous and called for decisive measures to deal with extremism as insistently as did liberal and rightist papers. Typical of anti-Bolshevik editorials appearing in moderate social pap socialist papers in the aftermath of the July days was one in Izvestia, the main organ of the Central Executive Committee, on July 6th. According to Pravda, the goals of the July 3rd to 4th demonstrations have been achieved. In reality, what did the demonstrations and the Bolsheviks, the official leaders of the demonstrations, accomplish? They, the demonstrations, caused the deaths of 400 workers, soldiers, sailors, women, and children. They resulted in the wrecking and looting of private apartments and stores, they brought about a weakening of our forces at the front. They engendered dissension, shattered united revolutionary action, which is the main source of the revolution's strength. During July 3rd to 4th, revolution was dealt a terrible blow. If this defeat is not fatal for the entire revolutionary cause, the disorganizing tactics of the Bolsheviks will be least responsible for this. A similarly hostile editorial to the pillory appeared in Golos Soldata, a military-oriented organ of the Central Executive Committee, on July 6th. Gentlemen from Pravda observed its author, you could not have been unaware of what your appeals for a peaceful demonstration would lead to. You slandered the government. You lied and cast aspersions on the Mensheviks, SRs, and Soviets. You created panic, 
frightening people with the specter of the still unreal danger of the Black Hundreds. And now, according to the custom of all cowards, you are covering your tracks, hiding the truth from your readers and followers. A day earlier, a writer for the right SR paper, Volia Naroda, had declared emphatically, the Bolsheviks are openly acting contrary to the will of the revolutionary democracy. The revolutionary democracy, i.e. the socialist parties, Soviets, trade unions, cooperatives, etc., has enough power to force everyone to obey its will. It must do this in these feverish days. Oh, in these feverish days, any procrastination might prove fatal. The provisional government had, con had contemplated the use of force to suppress militant leftist groups for the first time after the April crisis. During the late spring and early summer, mounting pressure for such action had been exerted by the military high command and by conservative and liberal political circles, thoroughly alarmed by expanding anarchy at home, as well as by apparent chaos among soldiers at the front. Prior to the July days, however, the government's capacity to move against the extreme left was limited by its lack of authority among the Petrograd masses and by the reluctance of many deputies in the central Soviet organs to countenance repression so long as any hope remained that such measures could be avoided. The July uprising strengthened the determination of the government to take whatever action was necessary to prevent similar outbreaks in the future. At the same time, a number of factors militated against the Soviets' continued opposition to the application of force against the left. For one thing, as we shall see, the July experience triggered an indiscriminate reaction against all leftist groups, moderate socialists included, thus putting the Soviet as well as the Bolsheviks on the defensive. Of course, the capacity of the Soviet leadership to influence the government's behavior was closely related to the authority that the Soviet enjoyed among the masses. Following the July uprising, workers, sailors, and soldiers in the capital were confused and dispirited. Whom they would follow in the future remained to be seen, but in the short run, the Soviet's power base was at best uncertain. Meanwhile, troops dispatched from the front to the capital provided the government at long last with a sizable military force upon which it could, de it could depend further decreasing the likelihood that the Soviet would interfere in the provisional government's adoption of repressive measures was the fact that the events of July 3rd to 5th persuaded heretofore, heretofore wavering Soviet deputies of the need to act quickly and decisively to restore order and, in this connection, um, to take a firm stand against the Bolsheviks. While reluctantly acknowledging the necessity of repression, most moderate socialists did not give up striving for reform and immediate peace. They insisted that repression be kept to a minimum, and, most important, that exceptional measures be taken only against individuals accused of specific crimes, not against whole groups. In contrast to the Liberals, the Mensheviks and SRs were genuinely, genuinely alarmed by the danger that the reactionary wave following the July days posed for the revolution. But their response to the threat of counter-revolution, like their earlier response to attacks from the extreme left, was to rally more closely behind the government and to insist on coalition with the liberal parties. It is ironic that the Soviet leadership had become most receptive to closer cooperation with the government at a time when the latter was in, was in a shambles. It will be recalled that three cadet ministers withdrew from the cabinet on the night of July Second, they were followed into retirement three days later by Perev, Perev Verzev, who resigned in the wake of criticism of his unauthorized release of the Alexinsky Pankratov documents. Prince Lvov himself left the government on July 7th after socialist ministers presented him with a list of general principles intended as the basis of a political program for a new coalition. Modeled after proposals for reform adopted by the first All-Russian Congress of Soviets, these principles were simply too radical for, L for Lvov. Unable to accept them, he resigned. The remaining cabinet members, 
now named Kerensky acting prime minister and entrusted him with the formation of a new government. Simultaneously, most of the measures rejected by Lvov were incorporated into a Declaration of Principles, released for publication in the cabinet's name on July 8th. Among other things, this declaration pledged the government to arrange an allied conference in August for the purpose of working out the details of a compromise peace proposal and to take all steps necessary to ensure the elections to the Constituent Assembly would be held on September 7th. The declaration acknowledged the importance of adopting, at the earliest possible moment, local government reforms based on the principle of universal direct and secret suffrage, and promised the abolition of estates and of civil ranks and orders. Moreover, it pledged the government to the preparation of an overall plan for regulating the national economy and to the immediate passage of meaningful labour legislation. Finally, it committed the government to the preparation for submission to the Const Constituent Assembly of a basic land reform program transferring all land into the hands of the peasantry. To judge by Lvov's statements to the press at the time, this endorsement of revolutionary changes in, in land, hold land holding was what disturbed him most of all. In deference to the Liberals, the Declaration made no reference to the dissolution of the Duma and the State Council, or to the immediate declaration of the Republic, two demands that had been endorsed by the Congress of Soviets and that were included in the original list of principles drawn up by the Socialist ministers. As the price of their participation in a new coalition, the cadets now demanded that the government disavow the Declaration of July 8th. Confident that the bulk of the population shared their view, that the July days had discredited the mod moderate socialists along with the Bolsheviks, and consequently that a pro propitious moment for the reestablishment of order and the preeminence of the government had finally arrived, the cadets were adamant in demanding that in the future socialist ministers maintain complete independence from the Soviet. In internal affairs, they insisted that the government abjure consideration of any further social reforms. In keeping with this position, they demanded that Chernov be replaced as Minister of Agriculture because of his role in facilitating land reform. Moreover, they called for an end to pluralism and government th governmental authority, i.e. to the political and administrative authority of Soviets and committees. On the war issue, the cadets insisted that the government be guided by the principle of total commitment to the Allies and that it take all steps necessary to re-establish traditional military discipline and to build a strong army. Negotiations aimed at somehow squaring these demands with the Declaration of July 8th were naturally tortured and acrimonious. While they dragged on, Russia, more than ever, was without effective national leadership. Meanwhile, the, initial, the initially successful offensive at the front had been turned into a most terrible rout of the Russian armies by the Germans, who launched a massive, devastating counterattack against the Russian 11th Army in the southwestern front. Boris Savinkov, government commissar for the southwestern front, now telegraphed Petrograd. The German offensive is developing into an unprecedented disaster. Most units are in a state of rapidly spreading disintegration. There can be no talk of authority or discipline. Some units are withdrawing from their positions on their own, without even waiting for the enemy to approach. There were cases when orders for immediate reinforcements were debated in meetings for hours, with the result that these reinforcements were as much as a day late. Long columns of deserters stretch for hundreds of versts. A verst equals six-tenths of a mile to the rear. Let the entire country know the truth of what is happening here. Even before receipt of this oppressive news, the All-Russian Executive Committee had gathered in joint session on the night of July 7th to 8th to discuss the latest developments, the most important being the behavior of the Bolsheviks, the sudden explosion of counter-revolutionary sentiment, and the breakup of the cabinet. This meeting culminated in the passage of a resolution that characterized the July movement as an adventurous abortive armed uprising by anarcho-Bolshevik elements. 
while stressing that exceptional measures could be taken only against individuals. This resolution explicitly recognized the responsibility of the government to assure the protection of revolutionary freedoms and the maintenance of order. At the same time, it strongly endorsed immediate passage of the reform legislation called for by the Congress of Soviets. For most moderate socialists, word of the debacle at the front appeared to reinforce strongly the need for the creation of a representative national government powerful enough to halt expanding anarchy. A joint emergency meeting of the all-Russian executive committees was hurriedly convened late on the night of July 9th to 10th, soon after the situation at the front became known. Here, bitterness toward the Bolsheviks for subverting the policies of the Soviet majority, as well as support for the creation of a strong revolutionary dictatorship, reached a new peak. A succession of speakers lashed out at the Bolsheviks for, among other things, precipitating an assault on the Soviet during the, during the, fuck, during the July days. Being responsible for the conditions that had triggered counter-revolutionary activity, and perhaps worst of all, contributing mightily to the collapse of the armed forces. The influential Menshevik Fedor Dan spoke for the entire moderate socialist bloc on this occasion. A physician by profession and along with Lenin, a veteran of the first major social democratic organization established in St. Petersburg, among Menshevik leaders in 1917, Dan was slightly left of center. After the abortive June 10th demonstration, for example, he had strongly opposed Tseretelli on the question of applying sanctions against the Bolsheviks and their followers, believing that the Bolshevik threat was exaggerated and that precipitous action against the extreme left would only undermine further the position of the government and strengthen Lenin's hand. Now, his usually mild face, taut with anger, dressed in a shapeless military surgeon's uniform, he proposed that, in view of the prevailing civil and military emergency, the provisional government immediately be proclaimed a government to save the revolution, and moreover, that it be vested with comprehensive powers to restore organization and discipline in the army, wage a decisive struggle against any and all manifestations of counter-revolution and anarchy, and promulgate the reform program embodied in the cabinet declaration of July 8th. The executive committees subsequently adopted a resolution to this effect by an overwhelming vote. Let the government crush all anarchical outbursts and all attempts to destroy the gains of the revolution with an iron hand, declared a proclamation announcing this decision to the Russian public. Let the government carry out all those measures required by the revolution. It is worth noting that the Menshevik internationalists and left SRs, the extreme left groups within the Menshevik and SR camps, not to speak of the Bolsheviks, did not support the political resolution passed by the all-Russian executive committees on July 9th. In effect, a blank check for a government whose makeup and program were at this point completely unclear. Bearded, frail Yuli Martov, his voice horse from endless speech making, pince nez drooping slightly on his nose, spoke for the Menshevik internationalists. The son of a Russified, liberally inclined Jewish intellectual, Martov in his mid-40s in 1917, had been propelled into the, into the revolutionary movement by the injustices of Jewish life in Tsarist Russia, by the fiercely repressive environment and virulent anti-Semitism he experienced in school and by progressive ideas in forbidden books, which he first encountered at home. Already a committed social democrat in the early 1890s and revered among his associates for his intellect, personal courage, high principles, and honesty, Martov had broken with Lenin, earlier a close friend and collaborator at the time of the Bolshevik-Menshevik split in 1903. From then on, he had been the Mensheviks' most prestigious and widely respected political figure. Following the outbreak of World War I, Martov had led the fight of Menshevik internationalists for an immediate negotiated compromise peace. Upon returning to Russia from exile abroad in early May 1917, 
he opposed the established Menshevik policies of limited support for the war and of participation in the government and headed a largely independent internationalist faction within the loosely structured Menshevik organization. Convinced that continued coalition government would lead to the destruction of the revolution, at the height of the July days, Martov came out for the formation of an all-socialist government capable of moving the revolution forward. Now, slightly less than a week later, he insisted emotionally that the Soviet's program for saving the country could not be realized if there were enemies on the left. Martov went on to read a Menshevik internationalist declaration expressing the view that the provisional government's foreign and domestic policies, because they were neither consistent nor sufficiently revolutionary, had contributed significantly to the crisis facing Russia. This declaration concluded that the revolutionary democracy, i.e. the whole spectrum of democratic institutions and socialist parties, could save the country and the revolution only if the divisions that had already appeared in its ranks were not exacerbated, if all the powers of a revolutionary government were concentrated on combating the mounting threat of counter-revolution, and if, and if decisive steps toward reform could convince the army that in rebuffing the enemy it was shedding blood for land, freedom, and an early peace. A few days later, at a plenary session of the executive committees on July 17th, after the cadets had made plain their terms for entry into the government, Martov insisted that the Soviets had no choice but to assume full governmental power. Either the revolutionary democracy will take responsibility for the revolution upon itself, he declared, or it will lose the ability to influence the revolution's fate. Events would soon show that Martov's vision of a revolutionary Soviet government uniting all socialist elements carrying out a broad program of reform vigorously challenging the counter-revolution and striving in every way to arrange an immediate compromise peace corresponded quite closely to the aspirations of the politically conscious Petrograd masses. We shall see, for example, that precisely these goals were expressed in the discussions and resolutions of most district-level Soviets in the aftermath of the July days. Within the SR Menshevik leadership at this time, however, Martov's views were shared by a relatively small minority. Discussion of political issues at the Executive Committee's plenum on July 17th culminated in an endorsement of the position adopted by the, by the Executive Committees on July 9th. In view of the commitment of most Mensheviks and SRs to the provisional government and to coalition politics, it is not surprising that in negotiations to form a new cabinet, the moderate socialists ultimately gave up considerable ground to the, to the cadets. These negotiations took place on July 21st and 22nd, after Kerensky, frustrated in his previous efforts to create a new government, abruptly tendered his resignation, which the remaining ministers refused to accept. Instead, they met with representatives of the various competing political parties, Central Soviet Organs and Provisional Committee of the State Duma and agreed to give Kerensky complete freedom in forming a government. Armed with this mandate, Kerensky proceeded at this point to engage ministers on a non-representative basis. Under this mutually acceptable arrangement, cabinet members would not act as representatives of their respective parties and socialist ministers would no longer be formally responsible to the Soviets. Although individual ministers might support the declaration of July 8th, the cabinet as a whole would not be pledged to it. In practice, this meant that the Soviets' leverage over the government was further reduced, while the principles put forward by the socialists, even in the scaled-down version of July 8th, were no longer a part of the government's program. On this basis, the Second Coalition, headed by Kerensky and composed of eight socialists and seven liberals, came into being. The most influ influential figures in the new cabinet were Kerensky. In addition to becoming prime minister, he retained the war and naval ministry and two of his close associates, Nikolai Nekrasov, deputy prime minister and minister of finance, and Tereshenko, foreign affairs. To almost everyone's surprise, Chernov managed to remain the Minister of Agriculture. Among those missing from the new cabinet was Tsuritelli, 
in ill health and overwhelmingly tired of cabinet politics, he now opted to concentrate his energies on the affairs of the Soviet. The government crackdown on the Bolsheviks began very early on in the morning of July 5th with the dispatch of a large detachment of Sorry. The government crackdown on the Bolsheviks began very early on the morning of July 5th with the dispatch of a large detachment of military school cadets to raid the Pravda editorial offices and printing plant. The cadets arrived at their destination only a little too late to catch Lenin, who had left the premises moments earlier. A few members of the Pravda staff were beaten up and arrested during the raid. The cadets made a thorough search of the press, in the course of which they wrecked furniture and equipment and dumped bales of freshly printed newspapers into the nearby Moika Canal. Featured accounts of this episode in many Petrograd newspapers, the next day triumphantly disclosed that the cadets had turned up a letter in German from a, from a German baron. The letter was said to have hailed Bolshevik activity and expressed the hope that the party would acquire predominant influence in Petrograd. German correspondence found was the way a headline in Malankaya Gazeta summed up this discovery. On July 4th, the cabinet specifically authorized the, com the command of the Petrograd military district to remove the Bolsheviks from the Shezinskaya Shiz mansion. Before dawn on July 6th, a full-scale attack force commanded by A.I. Kuzmin <clears throat> and composed of the Petrogradsky Regiment, eight armored cars, one company each from the Priobrzensky, Semenovsky, Sem and Volinsky Guards regiments, a detachment of sailors from the Black Sea Fleet, some cadet detachments, students from the Aviation Academy, and a frontline bicycle brigade, all supported by heavy artillery prepared to storm the Bolshevik headquarters. Warned of the impending attack, some second-level party leaders at the mansion seriously contemplated resistance and even began preparations in this regard. But in the end, it was recognized that the situation was hopeless and the Bolsheviks made a successful dash to the Peter and Paul Fortress, then still occupied by friendly forces. In the... In the... Shazinskaya mansion... Kuzmin's troops seized a substantial quantity of arms and arrested seven Bolsheviks who were working frantically to complete the evacuation of party files. Moreover, they discovered in an attic some pogromist Black Hundred leaflets, evidently left there in Tsarist times. The Black Hundreds were extreme rightist groups that organized pogroms in late Tsarist Russia. To Petrogradskaya Gazeta, this, fi this find indicated that the Bolsheviks were in league with the extreme right, as well as with the Germans. A headline in the paper on July 7th read, Lenin, William II, and Dr. Dubravin, a notorious member of the extreme right, working together. It is proved the Leninists organized the uprising in association with the Black Hundreds. In the early afternoon of July 6th, Government troops reoccupied the Peter and Paul Fortress, one of the last strongholds of leftist resistance. By then, several of the military units dispatched from the northern front had reached the capital. The bicyclists, an armored car division, and the second squadron of the little Russian dragoons had arrived in the morning in time to, to participate in the taking of the Shizhenskaya mansion and the Peter and Paul Fortress. The 14th Mistavsky Hussar Reg Regiment, in full battle dress, reached Petrograd in the early evening, preceded by standard bearers holding aloft a red banner with the legend, We have come to support the All-Russian Executive Committees of Soldiers, Workers, and Peasants. Deputies, sorry, Peasants Deputies. The regiment marched off to the General Staff Building to report to the government. The Minister of Agriculture, Viktor Chernov, welcomed some of the troops on the palace square. It makes me sad to speak of why you have come, he said, but I believe this will be your first and last such visit. We hope and believe that in the future no one will dare act 
contrary to the will of the majority of the revolutionary democracy. Between July 6th and 12th, the cabinet issued a series of hastily formulated directives aimed at restoring order and punishing political troublemakers. At a marathon session, the night of July 6th to 7th, it was decreed that all organizers and leaders of the armed movement against the government established by the people and all those making appeals and instigations in support of it should be arrested and brought to trial as traitors to their nation and the revolution. Simultaneously, the government published new penal regulations which included the following. 1. Anyone guilty of making public appeals for murder, plundering, robbery, pogroms, and other heinous crimes, as well as for violence against any part of the population, is to be punished by confinement in a prison or fortress for no longer than three years. 2. Those guilty of making public appeals for disobedience of lawful government directives are to be punished by confinement in a fortress for not more than three years or by incarceration in a prison. Anyone guilty of inciting officers, soldiers, and other military personnel to disobey the laws in effect under the new democratic system in the army or the directives <clears throat> of military authorities consistent with them is to be punished according to regulations pertaining to acts of treason. Kerensky named Prime Minister on July 7th had not been in Petrograd at the height of the July days, having left the capital for a tour of the front late on the afternoon of July 3rd. While at the front, he had received detailed reports on the developing crisis in the capital. In response, he shot off a telegram to Lvov demanding that traitorous actions be decisively suppressed, insurgent units disarmed, and all instigators of insurrections and mutineers brought to trial. While at the front, moreover, Kerensky was shown the latest issue of Tover Toverich, a Russian-language propaganda weekly published by the Germans for circulation among enemy troops. An article in this issue suggested to Kerensky that the Germans had known in advance of the insurrection in the capital. Naturally, this reinforced his belief that Lenin was a German agent. Incensed to the point of distraction, Kerensky boarded a train to return to the capital on the morning of July 6th at the railway depot in Polotsk. The carriage in which he was sleeping was partially wrecked by a bomb. Although physically unharmed, Kerensky was understandably unnerved by the incident. It is not surprising that, upon his arrival in Petrograd on the evening of July 6th, he was fuming and, and champing at the bit to have done with the Bolsheviks. From this time on, Kerensky stood at the forefront of cabinet ministers, speaking out for a tough policy toward the extreme left. Addressing a crowd of soldiers and workers from a windowsill of the general staff building a short while later, as two officers held his legs to prevent a fall, he pronounced, I will not allow anyone to encroach upon the triumphs of the Russian Revolution. With voice rising to fever pitch, he shouted, Damnation to those traitors who abandon their brothers who are shedding blood at the front. Let those who betray their country in its days of trial be damned. In an interview with the Associated Press several days later, after he had been officially installed as Prime Minister, Kerensky declared with equal vigor, Our fundamental task is the, f is the defense of the country from ruin and anarchy. My government will save Russia, and if the motives of reason, honor, and conscience prove inadequate, it will beat her into unity with blood and iron. First and foremost, the July insurrection was, of course, a garrison mutiny. At its July 6th to 7th session, the cabinet ordered that non-military units participating in the July uprising be disarmed and dissolved their personnel to be transferred at the discretion of the war and naval ministers. A detailed plan supplementing this order bore Kerensky's handwritten notation. Agreed, but I demand that this be carried out forcefully, without deviation. About the same time, Kerensky issued a strong condemnation of the Kronstadt sailors, implying that they were acting under the influence of German agents and provocateurs. All commands and ships of the fleet 
were ordered to turn over to the authorities in Petrograd for investigation and trial, all suspicious persons calling for disobedience to the government and agitating against the offensive. Steps, steps aimed at halting the disintegration of the army at the front were also initiated at this time. Thus, military commanders were authorized to fire on Russian units fleeing the field of battle on their own. Bolshevik newspapers were banned from all theaters of military operations. Political meetings among front troops were strictly forbidden. Most significant, the government decreed the reinstitution of capital punishment for military offenses in the battle zones, simultaneously authorizing the creation of ad hoc military revolutionary courts with authority to impose the death sentence. To prevent rebel workers and sailors caught in the central sections of Petrograd from fleeing to the comparative safety of the left bank factory di districts, the drawbridges over the Neva were kept open. At the same time, the country's borders were sealed to keep German agents from escaping abroad. Street assemblies were temporarily banned. The ministers of war and of the interior were empowered to shut down newspapers encouraging disobedience of military authorities or appealing for violence. By virtue of this order, the Bolshevik papers Pravda, Soldatskaya Pravda, Okopneya Pravda, and Golos Pravdi were closed. In a move obviously directed primarily toward disarming workers, all civilians in the capital were ordered to turn over to the government all weapons and military supplies in their possession. Failure to hand over arms was to be considered theft of public property and prosecuted accordingly. On July 7th, the cabinet made an S. Kerensky, prosecutor of the Petrograd Court of Appeals, responsible for investigating all matters relating to the organization of the July uprising. In view of this, the all-Russian executive committees agreed to drop the Soviets' planned independent inquiry into the insurrection. Even before the prosecutor's office was able to launch its investigation, however, the authorities in Petrograd had begun rounding up key Bolsheviks. The cabinets specifically ordered the arrest and detention of Lenin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. As we shall see, Lenin and Zinoviev immediately went underground, as did Nevsky and Podvoysky, the two top military organization officials. Only Kamenev did not flee. He was arrested and jailed on July 9th. Two days earlier, the government had incarcerated members of two large naval delegations dispatched from Helsingfors to Petrograd by the leftist-dominated Central Committee of the Baltic Fleet, uh, Centrobalt. Among the arrested sailors were such influential fleet Bolsheviks as Pavel Debenko and Nikolai Kovren. A week later, Vladimir Antonov Avsinko, another key Helsingfors Bolshevik, was also imprisoned. One of several suspicious characters in a car full of workers detained by a Cossack patrol at this time was Sergei Begdatiev, an Armenian by background who had once been a candidate for the Bolshevik Central Committee. On the afternoon of July 4th, Begdatiev was reported cruising around Petrograd atop an armored car, waving a rifle and crying out to, to keeping onlookers to arrest the ministers. Upon interrogation following his arrest, Begdatiev modestly admitted to being one of the organizers of the uprising. Newspaper accounts of his capture were very definite about two things, that Begdatiev was a German spy and that he was a Jew. To Melanchia Gazetta's man on the scene, Begdatiev's outward appearance, his hooked nose, his short reddish beard, and the fact that he was masquerading in a democratic workman's shirt were dead giveaways. Noted the reporter, Begdatiev speaks Russian well with barely a trace of a Jewish accent. Flavian Kostov, an editor of Okop Okopnea Pravda and the focus of a widespread manhunt since his escape from the Crosses prison, an ancient jail in the Vyberg district built in the form of two crosses on June 18th, was now recaptured, picked up leaving a theater at the Luna Park Amusement Center, evidently on a tip from an informer. 
Taking leftist leaders from the Kronstadt naval base into custody was infinitely more difficult for the government. In response to a, telegra a telegram from Kerensky demanding that counter-revolutionary instigators be turned over to the government at once, the executive committee of the Kronstadt Soviet wired back. Inasmuch as no one knows of any counter-revolutionary instigators in Kronstadt, it will be impossible to conduct arrests. Specifically directed to turn over several key Bolshevik leaders, Fedor Raskolnikov, <laughs> that was wrong, Raskolnikov, Semyon Roshal, and Af Afanasy Remnev, the Kronstadt Soviet persisted in its refusal to cooperate with the government. Only after the, nasal, only after the naval base was threatened with blockade and bombardment was it agreed that all of the sought-after Kronstadters, except for Rochel, who had disappeared, would turn themselves in. Subsequently, Rochel also surrendered. Encountering Raskolnikov in the crosses shortly afterward, he explained, After your arrest, it seemed awkward to hide. Alexander Kolontai, an internationally prominent Bolshevik, was in Stockholm during the July days. After the German agent scandal broke, the Swedish press made life miserable for her, implying that she was abroad to arrange for further German subsidies. Consequently, she hurried back to Petrograd. She later described her reception at the Swedish-Finnish border on July 13th. Some Russian officers boarded the train at Torneo and took her into custody. Word of her arrest spread through the station and crowds soon formed on the platform chanting, German spy, betrayer of Russia. A dining car steward with a napkin tucked under his arm chased after her screaming, It's the spy Kalantai. You belong on the scaffold with the betrayers of Russia. After the train had left Torneo, Kalantai and her guards made their way to the dining car but revolutionary Russia's self-appointed guardian was still on duty. Barring the way, he blurted, the spy Kolontai won't eat anything in my dining car. Adding that spies should be given only bread and water, he stubbornly refused to serve even that. As arrests of suspected leftists mounted, few non-Bolsheviks challenged the government. Among those who did were Martov, Trotsky, and Anatoly, Lun Lunikarsky, a playwright, Marxist philosopher, and powerful revolutionary tribune who at this time was a member of the Interdistrict Committee. At a Central Executive Committee meeting on July 17th, for example, Trotsky staunchly defended the behavior of the Bolsheviks throughout the July days and mocked the idea of Lenin's being a German agent. Lenin has been struggling for the revolution for 30 years, observed Trotsky. I've been fighting against the oppression of the popular masses for 20 years. We cannot be, but be filled with hatred toward German militarism. Anyone who says differently does not know what a revolutionary is. To help the Bolshevik cause, Trotsky agreed to defend Raskolnikov in court. In mid-July, he sent a letter of protest on the Bolshevik's behalf to the government in which he declared, in principle, I share the views of Lenin Kamenev and Zinoviev. My relation to the events of July 3rd to 4th was exactly the same as theirs. There is no logical reason for ordering that Lenin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev be arrested and not me. The government could not ignore such a challenge. Orders for the arrest of Trotsky and Lunikarsky as well were issued by Kerensky, Kerensky's office on the morning of July 23rd. Lunikarsky was picked up at his apartment a short while later. Trotsky, unaware that the authorities were on the lookout for him, called Kerensky that evening to discuss Raskolnikov's defense. When Trotsky inquired whether it would be all right for him to appear in court as Raskolnikov's lawyer, Kerensky replied, I'll let you know. Where can you be reached? At Larens, responded the unsuspecting Trotsky. Within an hour, a squad of soldiers knocked at Lenin's door and hustled Trotsky away. A warrant for Lenin's arrest was issued by the prosecutor of the Petrograd Court of Appeals on the evening of July 6. At once, a detachment of soldiers and officers from the Prio Brzezinski Guards Regiment, commanded by the head of the Counterintelligence Bureau, Boris Nikitin, rushed to Lenin's last known residence, the apartment of his oldest sister, 
Anna Elizarova. Although Lenin was not there at the time, Nikitin, who had been impatient to get his hands on the Bolshevik leader for months, was in no mood to come away empty-handed. While, N- while Nadezhda Krupskaya, Lenin's wife, looked on enraged, Nikitin s- supervised an inch-by-inch search of the apartment, confiscating papers and documents that seemed in any way suspicious. A reporter for Petrogradskaya Gazeta, who appeared at the apartment house early the next morning, recorded Lenin's neighbor's reactions to the latest events. All voiced indignation at the idea of having harbored an enemy agent and agreed that the tenants of number 24 had a lot of money. The word German was left unspoken. You can see for yourself, buildings like this with a grand staircase and mahogany floors are not at all common in Petrograd. pointed out the custodian. Lenin almost always travels by automobile, he added. Lenin and his wife have better linens than anyone else, confided a female tenant. Workers don't rent in this building, her companion chimed in. As the reporter prepared to leave, the custodian produced a petition demanding that the residents of number 24 be evicted immediately. Already em- embellished with several signatures, the petition proclaimed, we do not want such dangerous neighbor, neighbors as Lenin and his family. Lenin learned of the warrant for his arrest and of the search at Elizarova's, at the apartment of Sergei Alilluev, Stalin's future father-in-law, Lenin's fifth hiding place in three days. As he moved from hideout to hideout, Lenin weighed the pros and cons of surrender. Within his immediate entourage, opinion on the proper course to follow was sharply divided. Apparently, Kamenev, Trotsky, Lunikarsky, and Viktor Nogin, along with a significant number of Moscow Bolsheviks, felt that the Soviet could be relied on to assure Lenin's personal safety, and that under the Soviet's protection, he would receive a fair and open trial, which could be used as a forum for exposing the rottenness of the existing regime. They consequently urged that Lenin submit to the authorities. Several Petrograd party leaders, whose overriding concern seems to have been the negative impact of Lenin's flight on factory workers and soldiers, were of like mind. Volodarsky expressed this view during an intra-party debate over the issue of Lenin's appearance in court. This question is just not as simple as it seems. Up to now, we have been able to capitalize on all developments. The masses have understood us. But in this thing, Lenin's going underground, they don't. Dmitry Manulsky, who, like Volodarsky, had particularly close ties to workers and soldiers, commented, The question of Lenin and Zinoviev appearing for trial can't be looked at exclusively from the point of view of their personal safety. It is necessary to consider the problem from the perspective of the interests of the revolution and the interests and dignity of the party. We are forced to deal with the masses and can all observe the trump the bourgeoisie will play when the subject of our comrades ducking trial arises. We must make a Dreyfus case out of the proceedings against Lenin. According to the Bolshevik trade union leader, Alexander Shlyapnikov, the friendly advice of many comrades that Lenin submit to trial greatly upset Lenin's sister Maria, who favored her brother's attempting to reach Sweden. Many other Bolshevik leaders, a majority of those participating in the Sixth Party Congress, which met in Petrograd at the end of July, also feared for Lenin's safety in the event that he turned himself in. They contended that the proceedings against Lenin were part of a plot by the party's class enemies to destroy the Bolsheviks, and that in the prevailing climate, Lenin could not receive a fair trial. Indeed, that he would probably be assassinated before his case reached court. Thus, in the immediate aftermath of the July days, these leaders urged that Lenin go into hiding. Subsequently, amid a storm of criticism from both inside and outside the party, they staunchly defended Lenin's behavior. As late as the end of July, Stalin occupied a middle position in this argument, 
contending that Lenin and Zinoviev ought not turn themselves in while the political situation was still fluid, but implying that the two should submit if a government with some degree of integrity was established that would guarantee Lenin's safety. At the outset, Lenin apparently leaned towards submission to the authorities. On the afternoon of July 7th, he dashed off a note protesting the search of his sister's apartment and expressing his readiness to present himself for arrest if his detention was sanctioned by the Central Executive Committee. Sergei Ordsonikidze? I'm not going to retry pronouncing that. A longtime Georgian Bolshevik recently arrived in Petrograd, and Nogin were sent to the Nogin? Nogin? were sent to the Tarita Palace with this message and with oral instructions to negotiate the terms of Lenin's imprisonment. They were to obtain from B.A. Anisimov, an official of the Bureau of the Central Executive Committee, ironclad guarantees of Lenin's safety and the promise of a quick, fair trial. The two met with Anisimov later that afternoon. While unable to give any absolute guarantees, Anisimov evidently assured them that the Soviet would do what it could to protect Lenin's rights. According to Ordzonikidze, after his weak response, even Nogin was uneasy about Lenin's fate were he to turn himself in. These apprehensions were immediately conveyed to Lenin. At the same time, Lenin also learned of the All-Russian Executive Committee's decision to abort their inquiry into the July days, and this information appears to have had a bearing in his thinking. At any rate, on July 8th, Lenin made a firm decision not to surrender. In a letter that he now prepared for publication, he explained, We have changed our plan to submit to the government because it is clear that the case regarding the espionage of Lenin and others has been intentionally constructed by the forces of counter-revolution. At this time, there can be no guarantee of a fair trial. The Central Executive Committee formed a commission to look into the espionage charges, and under pressure from the counter-revolution, this commission has been dissolved. To turn ourselves in to the authorities now would be to put ourselves into the hands of the Milikovs, Aleksinskis, Perev, Rzevs, that is, into the hands of dyed-in-the-wool counter-revolutionaries for whom the charges against us are nothing more than an episode in the Civil War. On July 9th, under cover of darkness, Lenin left the Alilovs <laughs> and together with Zinoviev fled to the village of Razliv, near the small resort town of Restro Restroretsk on the Gulf of Finland, 20 miles northwest of the capital. Lenin remained there until August 9th, when he moved to Finland. At first, he and Zinoviev ensconced themselves in the loft of a barn on the property of a Sestroretsk factory worker and longtime Bolshevik, Nikolai Emilyanov. But since there was some danger of being spotted in this refuge by curious villagers, the fugitives soon moved to an isolated straw hut on the bank of a neighboring lake. Years later, Zinoviev remembered that one day he and Lenin were frightened by the sound of gunfire nearby. As the two hid in some bushes, Lenin whispered, The only thing left now is to die properly. The shots, it turned out, had been fired by passing hunters. By and large, such unnerving incidents were not repeated, until rain and cold made their hut in uninhabitable in August. Attacks by mosquitoes were the fugitives' greatest logistical problem. At Razliv, Lenin rested, swam, and went for long walks. According to Alexander Shotman, who, along with Aino Rakia and Ordzon Kidsi, maintained communications between Lenin, the party leadership, and Petrograd. Lenin was most of all concerned with conceiving up-to-date newspapers from Petrograd. He pounced on each fresh batch of papers as soon as it arrived. Seated on the grass, he would mark up the papers and begin scribbling comments on his notebooks. During this period, Lenin wrote regularly for the Bolshevik press, prepared pamphlets, and draft resolutions for consideration by his colleagues in Petrograd. 
most importantly for an expanded Central Committee meeting on July 13th and 14th, and for the 6th Congress, and worked on a major theoretical treatise, the State and Revolution. Throughout this time, criticism of Lenin's behavior and speculation in the press concerning his whereabouts continued. On July 7th, Zivo Slovo triumphantly headlined the erroneous news that Lenin had fallen into government hands, having been caught during the raid on the Shezinskaya mansion. The same day, Petrogradskaya Gazeta, not to be outdone, supplied its readers with further details. Basing its report on information from Matilda Shezinskaya's lawyer, who had rushed to inspect his client's home as soon as it was liberated, the paper revealed that some soldiers from the Valinsky Regiment had recognized Lenin, who was trying to pass as a sailor. On July 13th, Lenin's flight was the center of attention at a meeting of the All-Russian Executive Committees. Coming in the wake of news of still more disasters at the front and increasingly unrestrained activity on the part of rightist organizations hostile to the revolution, this meeting quickly turned into yet another public demonstration of the, of the Soviets' commitment to the provisional government and its hostility toward the Bolsheviks. More a political rally than a business session, the meeting began with Kerensky, just back from another trip to the front, delivering an impassioned plea for the Soviets' support and for a decisive break with Bolshevism. This was Kerensky's first appearance in the Torita Palace since his ascension to the post of Prime Minister, and the galleries were packed for the occasion. Waves of applause greeted the Prime Minister's appeal, as well as uh, Chikadze's response. No sacrifice is too great for the defense of the revolution. According to news accounts, Kerensky sprang from his chair at this point and embraced Chikadze, Applause and shouts of long live the Republic and three cheers for the motherland reverberated in the hall. As soon as he could be heard above the noise, Fedor Dan rushed forward to speak. We have already done what Kerensky asked us to do, he declared. Not only have we delegated full support to the provisional government, we insist that the government make use of its power. Dan now proposed a bluntly Dan now proposed a bluntly worded majority socialist sponsored resolution accusing the Bolsheviks of crimes against the people and the revolution. The resolution branded Lenin's evasion of arrest absolutely intolerable, and insisted that the Bolshevik fraction initiate a discussion of its leader's behavior, and provided for the suspension from membership in the executive committees of all persons under indignity. In vain, Nogin protested. You are being asked to adopt a resolution regarding the Bolsheviks before they have been tried, he warned. You are asked to place outside the law the leaders of the fraction that prepared the revolution together with you. Dan's resolution carried by an overwhelming margin, and as the meeting went on, the condemn condemnation of the Bolsheviks became even harsher. To roars of approval and storming applause from the floor in the gallery, A.A. A. Bullitt and Tr Trudovic, delivered an emotional speech attacking remarks in defense of the Bolsheviks made by the trade union official David Ryazanov moments earlier. Ryazanov had drawn a parallel between the provisional government's demands for Lenin and the Tsar's government's insistence in June 1907 that the Duma cooperate in placing members of its Social Democratic Party fraction under arrest. Turning first to Tsaritelli and then to members of the Bolshevik fraction, Bullet, de uh, Bullet declaimed, You have the gall to make such an analogy. You say now the demand is for Lenin, then it was for Tsaritelli. Let me, let me compare how Tsaritelli acted then with how Lenin is behaving now. On this very platform, Tsaritelli came forward and declared for all to hear, We stand for an end to the present regime, for the destruction of the Tsar's system, and for the creation of a democratic republic. How is Lenin behaving? The only thing to say to him is gutless Lenin. Reports of this sensational meeting appeared in the press on July 14th, and on that day as well, Petrogradskaya Gazeta 
had some fresh news regarding Lenin's location. Lenin tracks found, proclaimed its headline. The hiding place in which Lenin is staying has been definitely established. Lenin fled to Kronstadt through Lissy Noss. The next day, Zivo Slovo disclosed that summer residence in Lissy Noss has been a man has seen a man resembling Lenin in sailor's clothes get out of a big car and board a cutter bound for Kronstadt on July 5th. At the present moment, Lenin is in Stockholm, announced Gazeta Kopeka on July 15th, quoting an absolutely impeccable source. On July 15th, Brzevi Vedomosti, citing semi-official sources, maintained that Lenin had indeed been seen or been in Stockholm. However, with the help of the German ambassador to Sweden and the not unknown Genetsky Furstenberg, he had already resettled in Germany. Finally, on August 8th, Zivoslovo revealed that information placing Lenin in Germany had been planted by the Bolsheviks themselves to throw authorities off the track. Lenin is actually only a few hours from Petrograd in Finland, explained the report with somewhat greater accuracy. Even even his house number is known, but making an arrest won't be easy. Lenin has a powerful, highly armed bodyguard. Reading such far-fetched reports in his hut at Razlev, Lenin often became convulsed with laughter. But for the most part, during the remainder of July and the beginning of August, the Petrograd newspapers must have been anything but pleasant reading. Maria Sol Solomova, a Bolshevik staff worker with whom Lenin stayed on July 6th, recalls that when she brought Lenin up to date on the news, he reflected, You, comrade Solomova, they might arrest, but me, they will hang. Lenin expressed similar apprehension in a note he scribbled to Kamenev. Entre nous, if they do me in, please publish my notebook, Marxism in the State. The, mo the memoirs of Shotman and Zinoviev provide valuable glimpses into Lenin's state of mind during this period. Schottmann remembered that for a time Lenin exaggerated the scope and impact of the reaction and was pessimistic about the short-term prospects for revolution in Russia. There was no use talking further about a constituent assembly, Lenin felt, because the victors would not convene it. The party ought therefore to marshal what strength it had left and go underground, seriously, and for a long time. The dismal reports that Schottmann initially passed to Lenin and Razlev reinforced these convictions. It was several weeks before the news began to improve. Lenin's pessimism in the wake of the July days is confirmed by Zinoviev. Writing in the late 20s, he recalled that at the time, Lenin assumed that a longer and deeper period of reaction lay ahead than actually turned out to be the case. Even socialist newspapers were full of outlandish stories about the conspiracy of July 3rd to 5th, and about Lenin himself. Such a sea of lies and slander was never thrown at any other man in the world. Lenin's espionage, his connections with the German general staff, his receipt of funds, etc., were the subjects of articles, poems, and cartoons. It is difficult to transmit the feeling we experienced when it became clear that the Dreyfus case was a reality, that lies and slander were being spread in millions of copies and circulated to every village, to every workshop. But although, but although the lies kept snowballing, there was no way to respond. The enemy became ever more insolent and inventive. Already the slander had spread to the far corners of the country and throughout the world. These were dark, difficult days.